the city of Alamosa and the county of Alamosa sits in a vast alpine valley called the San Luis Valley. And many, many years ago, there was a big, huge 1,500 square mile lake that has since then been called Lake Alamosa. And so we were underwater right here, uh, encompassing all of this area around Alamosa. On one side of the San Luis Valley is the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, and on the other side are the San Juan Mountains. And that lake uh, had an overflow event and drained. At that time, the Rio Grande uh, was a very large river. It was four to 500 feet uh, wide, which right now it's not that wide. It's a beautiful river, but not nearly as grand as it once was. At one point, uh, they started to, the United States acquired this area through the Louisiana Purchase, and Zebulon Pike came into the area to try to determine what was the United States and what wasn't, and came into this area on his expedition in 1807. And in 1807, they were, it was during the winter when they got into the San Luis Valley, and they went just south of here, in uh, the south of Alamosa, and built a stockade so they could weather the, the winter. During the time that they were there, Zebulon Pike and Dr. John Robinson, who was with him in, in his team of people, uh, they climbed this, this hill that's behind the stockade, and they were looking over this entire valley right here. And it was just filled with, this, with these beautiful rivers. The Canales River uh, is a conflu confluences with the Rio Grande at that point uh, near the stockade. And there was so much game and birds and everything. And there's a quote that they said in his journal, it was at the same time one of the most sublime and beautiful inland prospects ever presented to the eyes of man. In 1874, James T. Maddox founded this small community called Wayside. He built seven buildings, including a store and a post office. Elijah R. Williams was the first postmaster. Passengers and mail would be dropped off twice daily. Passengers could go inside for baked goods, ranching products, or they can even spend the night for only 25 cents. Soon after the Denver Rio Grande Railroad came into Alamosa, the building was used as a school until it was closed in 1878. And later, the post office was relocated to Alamosa in the downtown area. San Luis Valley was settled by Spanish communities in the 1800s and they developed an agricultural pastoral lifestyle using acequia systems along the watersheds of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains and the San Juan Mountains. In the late 1800s, the railroads began to expand into the region and it changed the area quite a bit from an agricultural pastoral barter society into an industrial capitalist society. Uh, Alamosa was founded when the railroads came to the area in 1878. The Denver and Rio Grande Railroad thought that this would be a prime location for its expansion westward and it would connect the northern and southern railroad lines above and below Colorado. So Alamosa was the largest and most prominent hub for industrial prosperity in the San Luis Valley. Um, and it was founded just two years after Colorado became a state. The word Alamosa is Spanish for uh, cottonwood. We have a lot of cottonwood trees around the area. We also have the Rio Grande River that flows through our town. Alamosa, the city, was established by Denver and the Rio Grande uh, railway back in 1878. What happened was is after the railroad came in the town automatically began to grow and expand. They started off with just a few little buildings to now we have several buildings throughout our city. The population now is uh, right under 10,000 people. So we've had a lot of growth in that time period and uh, this is one of the beautiful sites that I like to walk by from time to time and uh, just marvel at the aesthetics of it. This is the old post office building. Uh, in January of 1934, the postmaster John Heron and a group of spectators 
they came out and they opened up 20 different bids for the purchase of this land and this property to build this building. It was said that they were not gonna pay no more than $13,000 for the site for this building to be located. Uh, the building was eventually purchased by the U.S. Treasury Department in which in those days from the 18, late 1800s until the 1930s, the U.S. Treasury Department was the ones responsible for funding projects like this. And this project was funded as a part of the New Deal. So construction got underway uh, after several delays and after issues with getting furniture in and making sure that they had everything ready to open. It finally opened in November of 1935. Uh, they moved from the old Elks building down the street to this location. They operated this building uh, for over 30 years. From here, after they closed this building down, they moved to the new location where they are currently, right off of 3rd Street and State, next to Cole Park. Before there was Alamosa or Alamosa County, there was um, Conejos County, and that was actually created pre-statehood as territorial lands. It was later divided into Costilla County as well. Um, but Alamosa was originally part of Conejos County. It wasn't until 1913, in fact, in the middle of the Maestas case lawsuit that Alamosa County was created and broken off from Conejos County. Before Alamosa was settled, the San Luis Valley had several settlements in the lower region, part of Conejos County, which Alamosa was part of at the time. Um, there were a lot of Hispano settlements, um, agricultural communities, pastoral communities, and they were very much a barter-based society. And it wasn't until the railroads were introduced in the area that things started to change in the region. Governments began to, one might say, unjustly take lands back. And many of those lands were taken against landowners' wishes, held by title companies and land ownership companies. And the Hispanics were expected to pay back money for their lands to keep them, but they were a pastoral agriculture society that was based on the barter system. They didn't have the funds to do that. So most of the lands were lost to the government or prospectors, um, miners, railroad towns coming into the area. By the mid 1800s, there were settlers that were coming up from New Mexico to settle land grant areas in the southern part of the San Luis Valley. And, and so they were settling down there and the town of San Luis is the oldest town, incorporated town in Colorado and it was uh, founded in 1851. Then in the 1870s, there were mining operations that were starting on the perimeters around the mountains. So in uh, Summitville and Creed and up around on the Sangre de Cristos as well, the settlements there started to happen, but there's this great big valley in between all of those settlements, and they needed to get transportation to go across the valley to, to those different settlements. First thing that came was the Barlow and Sanderson Stagecoach, and it went across the valley, and one of the stops was right on north of the Rio Grande, north of present-day Alamosa, and it was a little village that, that came up as a stagecoach stop named Wayside. And then it continued on to Del Norte and up to Creed and all the way to Silverton. Shortly thereafter, they wanted to get the railroad through here. I want to tell you the story of a very enterprising family the Imperius family. Now they were in Chicago and in the Great Fire in 1871, they lost most everything that they had and they wanted to start over somewhere fresh and somehow found out about the San Luis Valley and thought there's a place that is up and coming and they came here. At that time, when they first arrived, the town that seemed to be the town where things would expand and grow was the town of Del Norte. So that's where they based themselves first. Then they got involved in, in agriculture and Del Norte was a key mining camp for all of the different mines all in that area, so it was a good place. But then 
uh, the founding of Alamosa and the boom of Alamosa began and they decided, hey, let's go to Alamosa and we'll set up there. They're thinking about what are the community needs? And one of the things at that time was the development of the agricultural industry. So they, they thought, hey, let's, let's be in servicing and wholesaling for, for the agricultural industry. They, they came to Alamosa and set up here and they looked at what was the, the community need in Alamosa and they started to see that agriculture was, was an expanding industry and there were farmers and ranchers but they needed the middlemen and a place to and processing. And so they set up a meat market at the corner of State and Maine and that was their first business and that went well and then they started getting into the wholesale of livestock, produce, hay and grain and they built a great big warehouse just south of the railroad tracks across from the depot. That went so well and they started to look at other opportunities and Herman Imperius himself decided that he would get into more real estate. And most of the buildings at that time around uh, 6th Street, which was the main road at that time, were wooden and they were secondhand, those ones that were brought over from, from Garland. And he decided that if he made some good stout buildings, he came from Chicago where they had really great buildings, and he decided uh, to, to make some good solid buildings that would be more attractive and last longer. And so that would be a better way to be able to draw people in for leasing and for retail and offices. Herman Imperius also had an important political career and he was the mayor of Alamosa for four terms and then he helped to found Alamosa County and become its first county commissioner. He also was involved in banking and he was uh, helped to start the first power and electric company and also was into mining. There's the, the Imperious Mine in Creed. So if you notice, there's a common thread here, going from Del Norte to Alamosa, getting involved with the agriculture industry, uh, doing, getting involved in these other aspects of community. Herman Imperius was one who noticed community needs and fulfilled them. And that spirit, that same spirit continues today in the business community in Alamosa, in the nonprofit community, some of the best nonprofits in the state are, are based in Alamosa, and then in our local government, noticing the needs of community and fulfilling them for the betterment of the community. Colorado became a state in 1876, and two years later is when Alexander Cameron Hunt decided he wanted to do, uh, take the railroad across the San Luis Valley. And it was a very good spot, he thought, to go to where there's a bend in the Rio Grande as it, as it turns through the valley, going mostly to the east, and then there's a big bend where Alamosa is that it goes mostly to the south and he thought that's a perfect place. There's lots of cottonwood trees. That's how Alamosa got its name, by the way, is it means uh, it's Spanish for cottonwood grove. So he decided to do that. And at that time, the end of the railroad was in Garland City, working its way across the San Luis Valley. By June of 1878, they had built the tracks up through the site, the town site for Alamosa and they decided, okay, let's settle Alamosa. They picked up the buildings and packed them up from Garland City and put them on the train, drove them across these tracks to uh, where the depot area is right now and unloaded them and set up a town within three weeks. One of the buildings, the Perry House, was a, a restaurant and boarding house and they decided it would be fun to have breakfast in the morning in Garland City and then they packed up the building and put it on the train, brought it to Alamosa, unpacked it, built it, and they served dinner in the same place that evening. Herman Imperius started with the Imperius Block is what it was called, which is this two-story structure. 
with retail on the bottom floor and offices on the top floor. If you notice that it's a, just got a beautiful red brick to it with lots of brick details with corbeling at the top and chimneys. On the corner here, that's the way it looked back in his day when he first started it. They had changed it a lot through the years and during the restoration process brought that back to the original look that they used to have. You'll notice too the transom windows, which are the smaller windows at the top of the big windows. That was something that was used in a lot of older buildings to bring light into those buildings. And those were covered up. Uh, and they opened those up and it just brought so much light. It was amazing how much light it brought into the interior that has some really nice metal ceilings, a good part of it. That beautiful lit up interior is it just, transformed the interior of that building. Then in 1909, he built the American National Bank building over here across the street. And it's a beautiful building that has a really great ghost sign on the side of, on the upper side, on the back side. And then after that, he started building on the sides from, from Milagros and from the Imperius block down to the alley. And then on the, and you'll notice that the transom windows are covered up over there still. And then on the other side on Main Street down, uh, there were several buildings that was a car dealership. And then also the San Luis Hotel is on that side that he developed. We're standing here over a hundred years later and Herman Imperius's foresight is amazing to know that this became the center of the San Luis Valley basically commercially. And this corner on Main and State where the Imperius block is, it was just such a great decision to build a building here. And today, it's a really cool story that it, it has Milagro's Coffee House, which has become kind of the community living room for people far and wide to come. And all of the profits go towards uh, helping the disadvantaged in, our, in the whole San Luis Valley. And so they're continuing to meet the needs in the San Luis Valley. If you notice, the building still has some of the original wood and windows, which is which is amazing. Uh, it's made of stucco, and um, currently this building is being used for offices for Blue Peaks. As a mayor of Alamosa, it's amazing to see how this city has grown from a small railroad town of four buildings that was established in 1878 to in modern day now where we have right under 10,000 people, several buildings and businesses coming to our community and the expansion of the need to relocate this post office because of limited parking. It's just amazing to see where we come from to where we are now. So Alamosa grew really big really fast and it brought a lot of people into the region um, and, and it was supposedly a really wild west town. Sixth uh, Street was the main street uh, right off the train tracks and there were a lot of bars and ladies lounges and gambling and pool halls and, and it was kind of a rough area to go through. The town grew greatly because of the railroad. There was nothing in Alamosa before the railroad decided to build a town here. A, a lot of the other communities in the area had small sheep herding camps or, you know, gathering areas that they had created prior to the addition of the railroad. But Alamosa was created specifically as a railroad town by the railroads for expansion, um, for profit. It was meant to create a capitalist society in this area and for the Hispanos that was particularly hard because they were always a barter-based agricultural pastoral society. Uh, so they were really forced out of their traditional lifestyles and forced to adapt and become a cheap form of labor uh, because they could no longer afford to farm after a lot of the lands were taken away. I'm standing here at the historic Alamosa County Courthouse, and I'm gonna tell you about a historic case that took place in Alamosa in 1914. This was not the courthouse this case took place at. At that time, courts were traveling from location to location. 
nonetheless, this was a really important part of American history, Colorado history, and Alamosa history. As Alamosa was being founded as a railroad hub, there was a lot of cultures and communities and languages that were merging together in one area. And with that, there became a lot of conflict. In 1908, the Alamosa School Board purchased land to build a Mexican school with the intention to provide language support to Spanish-speaking children that were living in Alamosa. Many of their parents worked for the railroads. In 1908, the Alamosa School Board purchased land on the south side of the tracks to build a Mexican school, with the initial purpose of it being a language support center to help assimilate Spanish-speaking students into English-speaking schools. That all changed when the superintendents changed and the new superintendent of the area decided that every student with a Spanish surname was to attend the Mexican school regardless of English proficiency. There was one man in particular, his name was Francisco Maestas, who had a son that he wanted to enroll in the Northside English speaking school because his son was fluent in English. He went to the principal and asked to enroll his son and he was denied. He went to the superintendent and asked to enroll his son, and he was denied. Now, Francisco wasn't the only parent who was trying to do this at the time. So these parents began talking about how they felt like this was racial prejudice because their students were American citizens. Their families had lived here for generations, and their children should be allowed to attend the school of their choice. In particular, Francisco Maestas lived closer to the Northside School um, he was the only Hispano to live on the north side of the tracks, and he tried with this argument to enroll his son. He was also denied. The parents banded together and formed the Spanish American Union, which unlike a labor union, was a union of parents who were interested in the education for their students. They drafted a resolution and got the support of the full Hispano communities, brought that to the school board, and were again ignored. After that, they went to the Colorado State Superintendent, they went to the Colorado Board of Education trying to appeal what the school board had said, and they were also denied. They went to local lawyers who told them that they should not pursue the case, they wouldn't have enough money, and they wouldn't win. So they went back and spoke with some members of the SPMDTU, which is a mutual aid society. It's the United States' longest running mutual aid society and was founded 30 minutes south of here in Antonito, Colorado in 1900. With the help of this society, they raised funds from all the small towns in the communities, families giving what they could to help hire a lawyer. With the assistance of the Catholic Church, Father Montel found a young lawyer from Denver. His name was Raymond Sullivan, and he decided he would take the case. Raymond Sullivan argued that the Alamosa School District was basing their distinction between schools on race. And the Alamosa School District said that they were not, that the students were deficient in language. So in turn, Raymond Sullivan took the students and put them on the stand. The court provided an interpreter who was to interpret from English to Spanish and Spanish to English. And the students were asked questions in English, and before the interpreter could interpret into Spanish, the students were able to answer in English. Uh, I think this is a major part of why Judge Holbrook ruled in favor of the Hispanics in this matter, because it was apparent that there was no language deficiency. Um, at the time, the school board also brought forth some experts from up north who had stated that the Hispanic students were doing great with the system of schooling. They had the highest scores that anyone could have, possibly not taking into account that they spoke English already. After a lengthy trial, District Court Judge Charles Holbrook ruled in favor of Francisco Maestas and the other Hispanic children, stating that if the children were so prepared in English, they could attend to the school of their choice in Alamosa. So this case was, has gone unknown for a very long time until some academics discovered it. Academics that are experts in their field uncovered this case about six years ago. Dr. Gonzalo Guzman, Dr. Jared Hansen, and Dr. Ruben Donato did a lot of research into this. They contacted the local courts here with district court judge uh, Martin Gonzalez and uh, attorney Ronnie Mondragon Jr and Conejos County Judge Jason Kelly. And they researched all the documents and found that this in fact is what we believe to be the first Hispanic 
desegregation case that was won in the United States. So not only is that a big win for Alamosa, it's a win for Colorado and a win for our country as a whole, that back in this early time in American history, in 1914, there were still people standing up for their rights, for equal opportunities and equal education. What's interesting is although they won the case and students were able to choose the school they wanted to go to, it, it really didn't end the struggle here. Um, and it's not something that was passed down in the Hispanic communities. It was really a story that was lost over generations. And I think it was lost because it was just one of many battles that the Hispanics were facing in the area. But it did provide an ample opportunity for a win. <laughs> In, um, in educational resources. And I think that discrimination still went on. Uh, the town still was greatly divided and some might still say is divided by the railroad tracks, um, by socioeconomic status at this point. It might not all be racial or language based, um, but I think it's class based at this point in our society. So I feel like while this case was a big win at the time, it was overlooked because of the many struggles that continued to go on in the area. And with the end of that case, it did not end racism in the valley. It didn't end um, oppression. And it was just one of the many stepping stones that Hispanics have had to take to get to where they're at today. Um, and I think that there's a, a lot of progress that has been made in our community and in our country. And I think that if we keep lines of communication open about history and how people have fought for it and how we're all just trying to make a better place for our families and understand other people's perspectives, we'll be able to understand each other's stories better. Um, in Alamosa, I think that there's, there's still a divide. So in the midst of this trial in 1913, was really when Alamosa County was created. So prior to that, Alamosa was part of Conejos County and Conejos County was a huge county that was created pre-statehood and was mostly filled with Hispano farmers. Um, when the railroads came in and created Alamosa, everybody gets a vote. They realized in the midst of this case that the white vote was being outvoted by the Hispanic vote. and. I can't say for certain, but um, it's Hispanic lore that that's part of the reason Alamosa County was formed, was so that they could consolidate their votes to their laws in the area of Alamosa that was different from the Hispanic areas of Costilla and Conejos County. And I find it really interesting that it happened mid-trial. So this is one of the many things that was happening in the area along with coal strikes. Um, there was a big uprising of different Hispanics uh, in their mutual aid societies and in their communities against this oppressive force um, for cheap labor and exploitation and discrimination based on language and race. Um, and the Maestas case is just one example of how they fought against this.